Come on, let's put our hands toward heaven this morning. Tell him he's worthy this morning. He's worthy of our life. He's worthy of our time, our talents, our finances. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of everything today. We love you today. We love you this morning, Lord. Father, I thank you that as we enter, have already entered into your presence this morning, what a precious Holy Spirit there is in this room. We thank you, Lord, that we already have, have more understanding of your worth and your value to all mankind and certainly to us. Today, Lord, we thank you for everyone that's live streaming with us or those that are here in the sanctuary, in the other buildings on the grounds here at Covenant of Peace. And we speak a blessing. And we ask you to touch every heart, every soul, every man, woman, boy, and girl. Touch our babies. Touch our grandbabies. Touch our great-grandbabies. Touch our grandmas and grandpas. Touch our moms and our dads, our aunts and our uncles. And have your way and make us more like you. And we'll thank you for it. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name and everybody that believed that said amen. amen. I think we ought to give Jesus a good hand clap and a shout. Come on. Come on, we ought to praise him like we know how. Woo! Amen and amen. Great to see everybody today. What great worship. Hang on, before you're seated, I want you to do something. I want you to find three or four people, give them a high five, and tell them boldly, I think you ought to pay off all my credit cards. <laughs> Come on, do that with some people today. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> Did it work for anybody? Anybody okay? You got a yes? Huh? You, you don't even have a, uh, there you go. I know it, man. Hallelujah. I, I'll pay off all your credit cards, but I'm going to have to borrow money from Miss Angel this morning. I'll pay them all off. Great to see everybody today. Welcome, those of you that are live streaming. Uh, welcome today. I'm Pastor Jim Crabb from Cincinnati and uh, at Imago Dei Christian Fellowship. It's a joy and an honor to be here uh, today. This is one of my churches and one of my favorite churches. I always say this when I come here, but I mean it too. If they ever run me off in Cincinnati, I know where I'm coming. I'll be here. So, praise his wonderful name. How's everybody doing up here? Has the pastor been preaching good? I know he has. He always preaches good, doesn't he? How's, his, how's, uh, how's uh, Miss Angel been acting? She been behaving herself? A little shaky? Hallelujah. I know that there, if there's a rock in this church, it, it looks just like Miss Angel, man. She keeps it all straightened out, man. We sure love you, Angel. God bless you. What a great pastor's wife. Don't you think the pastor's wife has the greatest reward in the kingdom of heaven? It's not the pastor. The pastor, we're going to get a great reward. But the greatest reward, to me, is not the pastor, like Pastor Ken and I, we're doing this because we don't have any option. We got called to this. There's a fire shut up in our bones, and we've got to do this. We've got a calling that we have to fulfill. On the other hand, our wives, Angel and my Sarah, they, they married us because they thought we were real cute and handsome and had big muscles and strong, and that we had a lot of money. <laughs> 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 
I know at least the money part wasn't right for Sarah when we got, I'm not even sure about the other parts, but they married us. They married us because they loved us, man. And I mean, I know they, they had a leading, of course, and things, but my point is, I'm doing it. I got no choice. Our wives are doing it because they love us and they have a great choice. Now, our wives, mine and Pastor Ken's wife, they didn't know what all that was going to mean when they married us. I mean, it, it has meant a whole lot of different things. And uh, it's taken them a lot of different places. But I'm telling you, I think they are champions in the body of Christ. They are our heroes that help us fulfill what we're called to do. Amen. And they're doing it by choice. And I'm really grateful for that, aren't you? It's really good. <clears throat> so if you've got a preacher that's called, you've got a preacher's wife right, to keep him straightened out, and then, and full of anointing in her own right, and then you got a bunch of people that are called to a place together like y'all, and you also are doing this by choice. There's a lot of churches you could go to. I'm glad that you felt led of God to go to this church, Amen. right? Don't you believe, I believe everybody's supposed to be somewhere. Somebody, you ask people sometimes where do you go to church and their, you know, their answer could be everywhere because that's what they do. But I believe we're called to find the first, somebody asked, this is a hard question for young Christians. Well, how do I know where to go to church? And I, here, here's my answer. Well, here's how you know the right church. Because what you're looking for is not a church that's got all these cool things and programs and all this stuff that's put together. What you're looking for is not that church, but what you're looking for is my right shepherd. If I find the right shepherd, then that means whatever pasture he's in, that's where I'm going to be and I'm in the right place. And I think this is a pretty smart Sunday morning crowd that was smart enough to know that Pastor Ken and Angel were your shepherds, amen, and you obeyed God and you came here, found your spot, amen, and you're growing accordingly, amen. So we applaud you as well. God bless you richly, amen. So I'm, uh, I'm, I've been digging around in Psalm 46 this yeah. week. I knew you would like that. Whatever scripture I say, you guys always like it because you love the Bible. Man. Psalm 46. He said, I'm going to give you, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you my last verse of this chapter first, and then we're going to go back and read the rest of the chapter. But here's the, here's the bell. Sometimes I got to help people realize when I'm making the bell ringing point. I got to help them understand that. And so I'm, I'm making the bell ringing point right up front. Are you ready for this? Yes. Psalm 46, 9. He... That's God our Father. That's the creator of heaven and earth. That's the one that sent Jesus to die for us. That's the, that's the Father in, as part of the Godhead. He that made all the worlds. I'll tell you what else he does. Psalm 46, 9. He makes wars to cease. Under the end of the earth. He makes war stop. He makes war stop. Say it with me. He makes war stop. And I got a word. For, here's my word this morning. Amen. After that good verse. <clears throat> he makes wars to stop. I got a word. The war's over. The war's already over. That's it. And that's what I'm going to preach about this morning. The war's over. We, we already won. 
I'm the happiest guy in Eden, I think, this morning. Because I came in knowing this, that I was going to preach on this verse. Hey, the war's over. I'm not trying to, you know, thank God. I'm not trying to get saved. I'm not fighting to get saved. No, the war was already over, and that made it possible for me to be saved. And that since the day we got saved, the war has already been fought, won, and all we're left to do, I'm sure you've heard this, all we're left to do is mop up and take the spoils because somebody has already been in that battlefield and won the war. I'm telling you, church, I think we've got to fight with a mindset or understand that's how we fight with a mindset that all the war is over. All our striving is done. We don't have to know how to be great military men. That's what David knew when he faced Goliath. Goliath in his armor and his sword and shield and how tall he was and all his array of battle. And some shepherd boy shows up and he knew the war's already over. And all it's going to take to win this whole war is I'm going to sling a slingshot. It's going to hit you right between your eyes and bring you down. I'm telling you, that war was over before David even got there. He was coming down. And your Goliaths and my Goliaths are coming down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This side over here is a little quiet. Let me stand over here and preach it. Do they need a little help most of the time? Does Pastor Ken have trouble with this group here? He does? No, he doesn't. Said by somebody in that group. What's the most excited spiritual group in the church out of the three sections? One, two, or three? (laughs) I think all of you are. Amen. Hallelujah. He makes wars to cease. Are you in any wars, any battles? You know, we, we, we're, we're in battles, but when we got the, we're in the battle, we got to know this is already over. We already know how it's going to turn out. I'm going to win because Jesus already won. Listen to the rest of that verse, Psalm 46, 9. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. That means this works everywhere. He makes wars to cease in America. He makes wars to cease in Africa, in Asia, in the Philippines, in Australia, in New Zealand. He makes wars to cease in Europe. He makes wars to cease under the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. So the bow, you know, the bow and arrows that the enemy would, would fight with this. I like this part. While I go in, while I, when I move into a situation where an enemy is coming against me, I know the war is already over and God has broken their bows. Now, I'm not a real hunter. That's, that's for you guys, the big tough guys up here in Eaton. Huh? The only hunting I do is at Kroger, depending on which section of meat I'm going for. Sir, I'm going to go hunting today and I'm going to bring home, I'm going to bring home the bacon today. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to go fight a pig. I'm g- because somebody at Kroger already fought my war. It's awesome. And they took the meat and wrapped it up, carved it out made it just perfect. So all I've got to do, hallelujah, is unwrap the package, take the meat, and put it on the grill. It's already done. That's, that's how I hunt. Amen? But when you, when you battle, when you have bows, and are there bow hunters up here? Is it, is it hunting time now? Right now? How many, how many hunters are not at this church this morning? Let's, 
Lord, have mercy upon them. I can't tell whether I'm praying they get something or they don't get something because they miss good old Pastor Crab today. <laughs> Let's play, pray God blesses them. I know they're faithful and they'll be here. Are, do many sisters hunt? If you're a sister hunter, wave your hand. Let me see. They're, <laughs> they're, uh, what do you mean? Yeah, there are men, but they're out in the stand with the bow, man. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's exactly right. Huh? He makes the bows. He breaks the bows. Now, I, I'm not being a hunter, but I'm not sure a broken bow is going to take down anything because it's broken. You need that thing right. You need it, you know, the string, what do you call that? <laughs> Stretched right and all that stuff. Whatever the thing does. It needs to be together. But if somebody comes along and breaks your bow, you just became a lousy hunter. You aren't bringing any at home any bacon or venison or anything else because God, this is what God's job is. He makes the war to cease and he breaks all the bows and he cuts the spear in half. So if they had bows and arrows, they, they broke the bow. He, he cut the spear, he cut it in half. And he burns the chariot. I like God. He finished it off. They showed up. They had a big chariot. And they were coming in like a big army. And God got there first. And the Lord said, he said, I'm going to take care of this business for you, Brother Jim. He said, I'm going to take all their bows. And he took all their bows, broke them. Then he took all their spears, cut them in half. And then I like it because, you know, the Lord could have just left it at that and they couldn't win if they didn't have bows or spears or weapons. But I like it because the Lord said, and now I'm going to burn their chariot. I want the devil to know today your chariot is on fire. Huh? And that means you got to walk home. What you rode in on, you don't have to even get you home. Your bow is broken. Your spear is cut in half. And your chariot is being burned with fire. I'm telling you, hell is in bad shape. That's why I had a guy in my, my little church in southeastern Ohio when Sarah and I were there for four or five years. Little bitty church, but we, there was a guy there. His name was Carrie. And I'd say to Carrie every time I saw him, I'd say, what do you think about Jesus, Carrie? And Carrie always said he'd get real serious. He'd wrinkle his face and he'd say, Pastor, hell is in bad shape. <laughs> I said, amen, I believe you because the war is already over. Hell is not some organized group that really love each other and have any capacity to win. Hell's in bad shape. Hell is not going to beat covenant of peace. It's not going to beat you and me. It's not going to beat Imago Day, Huh? Not because I'm a great fighter, right? But because I... I'm just with God and he goes with me and stops the war. He beats it. He tears every, tears their stuff all apart. And I don't know why. Doesn't that get, isn't that good? He sets their chariots on fire. Huh? I can just see the devil standing behind, be, beside that chariot. His bow's laying over here. His spears are broken. They're laying over here and his chariot's on fire. And the devil is whining and sobbing, standing next to this thing, thinking, well, how am I going to fight? Here's the point, Mr. Devil. You aren't going to fight because the war is already over. Jesus already made wars to cease. Now, what war are you in? Somebody, let me get, raise a hand. Tell me like a battle that you or someone you know is in. 
Raise a hand. Not everybody at once. We got to take your time. Here. Who, what, what kind of battle we in? Yes, sir. He's, he's, your neighbor is in a heart issue and he needs a miracle, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I thought that when he first said my neighbor, I thought, well, I've had some neighbors that I was at war with. I understand. I think I've lived next to that guy. Hallelujah. No, it wasn't the neighbor we're at war with. We're warring with the neighbor to help him. He's going through a heart thing. Who else has something? Huh? Yes, ma'am. Your husband is lost. That's a big war right there, sister. I got a word for you. Amen. The war is over. God knows how to get your husband, and he is going to get him. He's breaking all the bows of sin and all the spears of sin, and he's setting that chariot of sin on fire. And that husband of yours is going to be here right, sitting right next to you in the name of the Lord. I believe that, don't you? I love stories of sisters that come come to church. How long have you been a Christian? 26 years. And I love the story of Christian women that come to the house of the Lord on their own. Right? I've I've had my children's pastor for many years at Courts of Praise. And uh, had, she had four or five children and uh, her husband was lost, and he wasn't interested. He would boldly tell everybody, I'm not interested. I'm not going to church. Connie would give him invites all the time and tell him what God was doing. He didn't want to hear it. I'm not interested. I'm not going to be a Christian. But we had one weapon that we were working with. It's called we were praying for him. Amen. I'm telling you, man, when you start praying for people, I'm telling you, the hound of heaven. You heard that? Remember that? They used to... The, Old time Pentecostals used to say, the hound of heaven's getting after him. <laughs> you know what a hound, so I, now, I think I'm more of an outdoors guy than I gave myself credit for. I'm a rabbit hunter, aren't I? Or, the, you know, the, I've only been, I've been hunting twice in my life just to appease some brothers in the <laughs> church. One time I was in, the, the first time I went hunting, I was in New Mexico and when I was pastoring there and we went out, they, the brothers took me out one day and we were going jackrabbit hunt. You know, in the desert, they, there's these big old jackrabbits and uh, they, you know, you could, it's hard for them to hide because their ears are taller than the brush and they, I, they looked over and said, there's one right there. Go on, get that, get him, Pastor. And I was like, that that jackrabbit is glad I'm the hunter today. Because there is zero possibility that I'm going to hit that jackrabbit. That's number one. Number two, I don't even want to hit that jackrabbit. I sat and looked at that jackrabbit and thought, well, he hadn't done anything to me. Why am I going to shoot him? At least if he was going to be shot, he should shot, be shot by a real hunter. So that was my first experience. I went home with nothing and was glad, and so was the jackrabbit. Hallelujah. And then the, the second time I went, there was a guy that I was trying to win to the Lord, and he was a coon hunter. Huh? Any coon hunters in, here, in this place? Huh? You guys are afraid to raise your... Are you... You are doing when you were younger. All right. A coon hunter. And so I didn't know how coon hunting went. I thought it was like big game hunting or something. Well, then I found out, well, we got to take these dogs. I thought, well, are they part of the hunting thing? They said, oh, yeah, it's they're, they're key. And we get out into the woods and here was the, and we're doing it at night in the middle of the night. I'm like, I want to go watch a baseball game or something. (laughs) And now I'm marching through the woods, and I don't even know what's going on. And I said, well, how do we know where the raccoons are? He said, we don't have to, because the hounds do. A coon hound. 
and they, those coon hounds knew how to track those, those raccoon. And then the, I think I'm right. Correct me if I get wrong here. Uh, they would chase that, find that coon and run that coon. They'd run him up a tree. Isn't that right? And then the hunter, is this really even qualify as hunting? The dog finds the, right, the raccoon, runs him up a tree. The coon is stuck at the top of the tree. And the hunter, like a big shot, walks over with a gun and goes, boom. And poof, then the raccoon falls out of the tree. Huh? So that's all the hunting I've ever done in my life right there. Amen. Raccoons aren't scared of me either because I wasn't going to do that, man. And, uh, but we have wars we're in. But there, we, there's, a, no, I should say, there's a battle that we're in, but the war part is already over. Our enemy, their bows are broken, their spears are broken, their chariot is on fire. And all we do is now pick up the spoils. Meaning, we take all their valuable stuff. Right? This gal that was in my church, whose husband was lost, my children's pastor, for all those years, we had a weapon called prayer. And we pray for Rick. And uh, it didn't look like, how many know sometimes when you pray, sometimes for a long time, it doesn't look like anything changes. But God is moving in the spirit. You can't see everything that's going on. Huh? You don't know. And, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I don't even think Connie invited him that night. It was a Thursday night church meeting. We have Thursday night, you know, midweek. So it was Thursday night. And all of a sudden, I was just getting ready to stand up and preach. And I looked up and here came Rick. And he came in, sat down about halfway back. And I preached my heart out and told him the gospel. I Not just add him, but, well, okay, add him. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no, wait a minute. Let me give myself more credit. Here's how I hunt. I smell out a good sinner in the crowd. And I run them up a tree somewhere. A tree looks like these pews this morning. I run them right into that pew. And then I, then I fire my gospel gun. Pooh. That night, with God as my witness, before I, I just, when I started to give an altar call, I saw the Holy Ghost. This is going to happen for your husband. What's his first name? Bob. God is going to touch Bob like he touched Rick. And all of a sudden, I saw Rick. You know that, that quivering lip thing? Huh? It's like, okay. This is, he's going down, man. Then it started coming out. His eyes were crying. He was crying and all that. And before I even finished the altar call, he was, he was coming to the front. Knelt down, got saved, and gave his life to Christ. That's how God's, that's the kind of hunting we do. Because God's already done the work. It wasn't because I was the great, a great preacher. It wasn't because Connie had witnessed to him all that time. It's because God was hunting him down. And he was going to win his soul and win his heart. And he's getting Bob's heart. I can't wait to meet Bob. Huh? Would Bob like me, you think? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me like I don't even like you surely Bob's not going to like you man <laughs> Bob Bob would be a nervous wreck man if he was here man. Yeah, but I mean when Bob gets right with God he's going to really love good old Pastor Crab. hallelujah 
Wouldn't that be awesome? Does he live stream? No, he's not a live. I wish Bob was live streaming right now. I'd have all of us turn around and wave at Bob. We're talking about you, Bob, because we love you. We were where you were once one time. But God made the war to cease, broke the bows, cut in half the spears and set the chariots on fire. And now we're just picking up the spoils of his of Christ's work in your salvation. I remember just talking about those kind of things at the little Pentecostal church. You know, I was this I, I had gotten saved, but I for a long time I didn't have I didn't. I was like somebody that got born again, like a like a birth of a baby and just dropped them off at the on the corner. I didn't have I didn't have my shepherd. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to read a Bible. You know, you've seen this thing. You know, this is how I started out. I thought this this ribbon was a Bible carrier. (laughs) I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know who Matthew was, what Mark did. I didn't know anything about Elijah. I didn't know anything because I was lost and I I just got saved. But I started learning stuff. And so when I when we went to I got saved and finally I found my shepherd. Pastor Jerry was his name, the most Christ like man I'd ever met on this planet. You could his eyes just looked like the love of God, cared for the poor sacrifice, taught me how to be a a real Christian, self-sacrifice, love people, pay the price, pray, all those things. And um, so I, I started going to church there. And then there was a girl that I, this little German girl that I used to go out with. She was a cute little German girl cute little blonde and she really liked me and but then I got you know I got touched by God and so but I and 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 I really did like her Sarah knows this so there's no worry you tell him (laughs) I'm not concerned if you you, he this he was taking notes here he's going to send something to Sarah no I'm already in trouble today. (laughs) No, but, and, and, but I thought I'm going to, I'm going to take, I'm going to bring her to a Saturday night service at the little Pentecostal church. Now at that little Pentecostal church, there was one room you can imagine, you know, one room, little Pentecostal church with wooden floors, uh, there wasn't any other class. There was, there was a couple closets and that was all they had. You know, somebody said, well, didn't they have a nursery? I said, yeah, it was right under the pews. <laughs> get down here and get under this pew and draw a picture of Jesus and shut up for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> then, and then some of them would come up, some of the little boys and girls would come up to me after the service and they'd hand me a picture and they'd drawn not a picture of Jesus, they drew a picture of me. <laughs> Always with a silly look on my face. But so that night I said, I'm taking, I'm going to bring this, this little German girl. Her name is Ute, good German name. And I told her we're going to church. Now Ute, all she'd ever been in was Catholic church. Her mother and dad immigrated from Germany and they were Catholics and that's just all she did. She went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. She'd never in her life seen anything like that. Now we we really do. We Pentecostals that are used to this, we need to have a little compassion on the people <laughs> that have never seen this. I'm telling you, I had never seen anything like this. And I mean, there was people that were chicken hopping and jumping and <laughs> falling on the altar and running around the building. And we had, you've heard that. We, we did have some guys, they'd run on the top of the pews from the front to the back. And if they didn't fall down, everybody would shout how the glory's in the house. <laughs> and, uh, but it, you never knew what was going to happen. And so 
that night I brought that little Pentecostal, or that little girl, that little Catholic girl. And at that time, I think I've told you this part of the story at the little Pentecostal church. They didn't they had the men sat on one side and the sisters sat on the other side. In my mind, I was like, huh, they they know me pretty well from my past. That's good. Just separate us so we don't get in trouble during the service. And so the, the brothers, so she didn't know a soul in there. It walks into this one room. She's all decked out. She, you know, pretty dressed up girl. And she sits in the second pew over on the end. And I'm sitting over here and I'm praying for her. I'm like, she's going to get out of here. And she's going in my mind. I was like, she's going to run out of here. Right. And then, I, you know, then I went into the prayer. We all pray as Pentecostals that have invited somebody to church. Lord, don't let Matthew get wild tonight, man, in the church. No, no, no. Let tonight be a night that Matthew doesn't run and lapse around the church and scream and holler and prophesy. But, you know, I just wanted to make sure she could stay long enough to hear the gospel with God is my witness. And they was, that was the twang twang church, I call it. It was the, the twang twang gospel music, you know. It just was nothing. You know, I'm, I, I'm coming out of the world, man. I'm coming out of Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, acid music, Black Sabbath, all this. And now I'm like, this twang twang. It was, you know, the twangy, twangy country sound. And, and we had a Radio Shack sound system that was terrible. And all of a sudden, then the second song of the night, the two, they sang one song, and then they were twanging the second song. And it wasn't like a soft little, softly and tenderly Jesus is calling. They didn't, they didn't know how to do that anyway, but it was a twang, twang, upbeat song. And all of a sudden, this little girl, and I'd not told her anything about anything that goes on here. She thought she was coming to church. In her mind, this is, a, this is going to be a Catholic service. And all of a sudden, I looked over, I glanced, and all of a sudden, she had her head down like this, and she started sobbing. And I thought, I didn't know what was going on. But all of a sudden, I saw her start sobbing and shaking, and without anybody, I don't know, she didn't know what an altar was. She didn't know what an altar call was. And all of a sudden, Without any direction, the Holy Spirit grabs her heart. That's what's going to happen to Bob. The war is not up to you. The war, Jesus is, is, is going to get Bob. And all of a sudden, he moved on Udi, this little German girl, and she started shaking, and she got up on her own, excused herself, and went up to an aisle. She didn't even, never seen anything like, never heard anything like this, and knelt at that off altar and cried for 30 minutes. And got saved that night. Hallelujah. Yeah. She's, she still wanted to marry me or something, but I saw Sarah in the distance. Hallelujah. <laughs> I said, I got you saved, but that doesn't mean I'm going to marry you, man. <laughs> How many are glad some of your past boy and girlfriends before Christ that you didn't marry them? Huh? Oh, man, my first real, real girlfriend in high school, her name was Nancy. And, man, I, we, I thought Nancy was the coolest thing, and we really, you know, had that high school love for each other. And, the, and, and Nancy... Uh, I'll just tell on Nancy. Let's just tell it all this morning. Then I'm going back home. Nancy was a real good kisser. <laughs> Woo, man. Nancy would plant a kiss on me, man. My ears would wiggle. Smoke would come out of my head. 
and then, but there was a problem. Me and Nancy fought like a cat and a dog. And it, it crossed my mind eventually. If I would marry Nancy, I would be in prison. <laughs> because either that or in the cemetery, because one of us was going to kill the other one. This is not going to work out. Praise God. So at any rate, <laughs> but isn't it awesome that God can get, how about you and me? You know, there were people that didn't think you were going to get saved either. Huh? I, there were people that never thought I could get saved. Yet I did get saved because somebody was praying for me. And they went, they went hunting for me and hunted me down, ran me up a Holy Ghost tree. Amen. Until Jesus got me down out of it. Amen. Now, I just feel like that we ought to just... Do you have lost unsaved family and or friends? You know, first we ought to get our family. All of our families coming. We've all got lost relatives, don't we? Huh? Shout a name out. Everybody at the same time of a lost relative that needs to get saved in your life. Shout it. Hallelujah. That all those names. There's a lot of people that need to be touched. Well, I believe today we ought to pray for all those people that God would start with Bob and sweep through this congregation, relatives getting saved, co-workers getting saved, huh? family members getting saved, people in relationship, neighbors getting saved and coming to Christ. Amen? Paula, can you come hunting? Praise God. Let's pray for our relatives and friends right now, can we? Come on, pray it out loud. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, for all the lost families and people that were represented today, that were spoken. God, I pray for them. Lord, you know how to hunt them down. I believe that war is over. I'm in a covenant relationship with you, and they're my covenant friends and family. And I ask you to go to them right now. Every lost relative that's represented in this building, get them, Lord, and bring them in. Corner them up a tree and let them come to the place of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and serve the Lord with a red-hot zeal with us together in the house of God.